And you thought it was just your family that was dysfunctional. Man, anybody have a dinner like that this week? You don't have to raise your hand. I mean, it's, 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 you're not the only one. You, you know you're not the only one. In fact, we all are human. Um, maybe some of us are superhuman as well. But um, we're all human, and we all face challenges with our families. And uh, as we even try to just have a conversation at the dinner table, um, that's very real, probably more real than we want to admit. So um, anyways, there it is. Um, if you haven't met me yet, my name is Corey. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. I'm really excited to have you with us. If you're here for the first time today, if somebody invited you, we want to say that we, wa- we welcome you and we're so glad that uh, you're with us today. We hope that um, this is encouraging uh, for you today. It's good to have you uh, with us. Obviously, Pastor Vince is not here today. Um, I can't exactly say why, um, but I will say this, that the Saints are playing the Bills in Buffalo. Um, So that's it. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, Be sure next week when you come that you actually ask him how his experience at church was. So Also, now honestly, he, he gives way more time here than, than, uh, than you want to know, and, and it's, good. it's good for him. Um, but I do need to say something, though, as we talk about, since, since I mentioned Pastor Vince, and we're talking about him, thinking about him, um, he, I, I, I got, got word about this a few weeks back that he started to say things about me. I seem to settle things a little bit here. He started to say that I, I just started shaving, <laughs> which might be true. <laughs> But there's also something else that you need to know that's true. I'll have you know that uh, what's also true is that occasionally he walks into the office with toilet paper stuck to his face. <laughs> In fact, there's a picture here of a recent service that we was at our photo team captured this. Um, <laughs> if you look closely, um, yeah, it's right there. You can't hide it. Um, he says it's like blood thinners and you know, stuff like that. I don't know. but So ask him about that, too, when you get him. Anyways, uh, we are continuing on. He'll be back here next week and definitely want to encourage you uh, with that. But we're continuing on in our current series called Someday. And really the whole idea with this series is we're trying to say, you know, it's not someday that I'm going to do this. It's maybe it's today. Maybe, maybe today is your someday. You know, we've been saying things like someday I'll have better relationships. Well, maybe that someday isn't someday. It's today. Right? I'm going to do things, I'm going to take some action um, and not procrastinate, not keep pushing off what I know I need to do. We, we mentioned it a couple weeks ago that, that someday I'm going to stop playing it safe. I'm going to take some risks for God. I'm going to really uh, push out into some unknown, unsafe seemingly territory. Uh, someday, not someday, today I'm going to start doing that. Or someday I'll forgive that person. This was last week's message. It was a powerful one. If you haven't, if you haven't um, listened to that, you can go online. You go to our YouTube channel. You can go to the, get the message at the Resource Center. But m- make sure you listen to that. Someday I'll forgive that person. <laughs> maybe not someday. Maybe we would do that today. And that someday would be today. We want to start happening to our lives, not let life happen to, to us. And that's what this whole series is about. And today we're going to be talking about having a stronger family. And I want to just say right off the bat that I'm just as much preaching to myself this morning as I am to you, that we are all in process and all of our families are. Um, there are ugly moments um, in our home, and, uh, and some of them even happened this week. I can tell you about it afterwards if you really want to know. Um, I will tell you this, though, that there was an ugly moment a couple years ago. I was, You know how you're on your phone and sometimes you look at pictures uh, in the past of, of just pictures you have stored up in your phone. Well, I was going through that last night just looking at our family and so many moments in there where, you know, these are pictures we posted to, to Facebook or to Instagram and it's, you know, it's, it's everybody's smiling and things are great um, and it looks like, wow, perfect family like that. There's also other pictures in there that aren't so, so good. In fact, there's one that I'm going to bring up on the screen here. It looks good. It actually looks good on, on this. I mean, these are my two kids, Addie, uh, Adelina, and then Cooper is, is Raphael there. And uh, this was at the fall festival, not this year, but the year before. What you don't know is that this day for our family was an absolutely horrible day. I mean, and, and some of you can relate to this, um, that, you know, as you get ready for the, these costumes or, you know, there, it doesn't just happen, right? Moms, you know, there's it just, you know, they don't just wake up with this costume on. There's a lot of drama sometimes. And there is, is more than one person in our home that needs to have things just, just so. And if it's not just right, which could change at any time things are a mess. I mean, it's not good. It's not good. In fact, getting to this point where these costumes were the way they were was, was a complete meltdown and mess. And, and, uh, and that wasn't just, um, 
you know, for the kids. It was for the parents as well. Um, actually, more, more on, on our part. Um, there, it was ugly, man. It was ugly because here's what happens, and here's what happened in this moment for us, that, that, that these costumes and the need for costumes and the perfect costume, whatever, it brings out insecurities. And you know as well as I do that when insecurities surface and they're brought out, people can get hurt if we don't process them well. And, and, and we tend to hurt the ones that we love the most. It tends to be the people in our families a lot of times. So in this, again, in, in this day as we got ready for this event, there was screaming, there were tempers, there were short fuses and drama and things blown out of proportion. And, and again, that was just for mom and dad, <laughs> not, not even for just the kids. For Shanna, my wife, my bride, um, part of her story is dealing with depression. She's very open about, about that, and, and, and I love how she shares her story with people and how it gives freedom and hope for others. Uh, but, but depression is just one of the things on board uh, with her that, that she, she deals with. And this was already a particularly hard day, let alone all these triggers. So we come to that event, and you know how everyone puts on masks and costumes and that. Well, we had... Literally and figuratively, mass. We walk into the day smiling, saying, "Hey, baby, it's good." Have that smile, but inside, all I want to do is go home, because my family is hurting, and we're all hurting. We're like wondering, "Are we going to make it?" In fact, that's the question I was asking. That I'm like, "Is our family going to make it?" Maybe you've asked that question before, as well. I want you to know that you're not alone. You're not the only one. You know, in our family, we have good days and we have bad days. But here's what I'm learning, and here's what I want to be challenging you with today as I'm challenging myself, and it's in your notes. It's the, the, really the big idea, the one central theme that we're looking at today is that strong families or stronger families, they're led by individuals who are confident, courageous, and committed. Can you say that with me? Say confident, courageous, committed. Say confident, courageous, and committed. Strong families are led by individuals who are, who are confident, in who God is and who he has made us to be, his character and his goodness, they are confident in that, regardless of what happens around them. But not only are they confident about that, they're courageous. They, they courageously deal with the hard stuff head on. And third, they're not only confident and courageous, but they're committed. They're committed to never, ever, ever give up, never walk out, and never Leave. And so we're going to talk about that today, and I want to encourage you with this. Don't check out if you don't feel like you're the leader in your family. Everybody is in a position of leadership, we believe, because leadership is influence. So if you're a son or a daughter in your home, you have influence. And there's amazing, I mean, I, I'm a father of six year, a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and some of the things they say, let me tell you, they lead me, all right? They influence me. In a big way. If you're a dad or a mom, you are a leader and an influencer. If you're a husband in your home, you're a leader in your home. If you're a wife in your home, you're a leader in, in your home. If you're married, if you're single, you are a leader in your home, in your family structure, whatever that looks like. And so you have influence. As we do that, we need to think well about how to, how to have a stronger family, knowing that it's all a process, knowing that, that we'll have good days and bad days. What I want to do today is I want to look at one passage in the Bible, specifically in the Old Testament, from the book of Ruth. And I'm going to talk about, from just Ruth chapter 1, the story of, of Ruth and Naomi and a conversation that the two of them have. And we're going to unpack that um, a little bit. The book of Ruth, real quick as some background, the book of Ruth is, is really a book that could have been part of the book of Judges. In fact, it, it all happened all that happened in the book of Ruth happened at the same, the very same time as all the events in the book of Judges. If you look at the book of Judges, though, it's one of the, the creepiest, trippiest, messed up, darkest books of the Bible. There's stories in there that are actually um, not suitable for children. It is, it is messed up, very complex, uh, very confusing, jilting. But the story of Ruth, though it happened at the same time, it's a beautiful story of redemption in the midst of a family that's plagued with horrible, unthinkable dysfunction. Kind of like the dysfunction we saw here, but a beautiful story of redemption that came out of that. In fact, it was, I believe, such a good story that it, it couldn't be placed, juxtaposed, right next to all the other stories in the book of Judges. We're going to look at that today, and we're going to find three, these three virtues of strong families. There are others. But again, that confidence, courage, and commitment. The first one in your notes is this, confidence. Strong families do this. They accept the fact that they're not actually in control of the unthinkable. 
So if you're taking notes, you can write that down. That, that strong families have a sense of confidence. Leaders in the family, whoever you are, um, in, in whatever stage in, in the family structure that you're in, um, there's a confidence that you have that, that you accept the fact that you're not in control. You, you're actually not in control of the unthinkable, the massive things that shape and mark your family. I want you to see this here in this, in this passage. In the notes, and in, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his, with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women who uh, was, were named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. There's a lot of big events that just happened in, in just seven verses here. I want to try to explain that a little bit and make it a little clear for you. Uh, we have a picture on the screen. It's going to be coming up here in the, uh, of Naomi. This is exactly how she looked um, when, when, not really, when you see that. Yeah, there she is. So that's, that's Naomi, and she had dreams. She had passions like any little girl growing up, right? She had dreams of her wedding day someday. She had dreams of what her family might look like and, and what their little house would be like. And then with the little kids running around, you know, and playing with toys and those Legos that they never stepped on. But those Legos, like the, she, she had these dreams. So she met the guy. She got a Limelech. A Limelech. I mean, what kind of a name is that? But that's cool. A Limelech. Like, that's, that's awesome. So she married Elimelech, and, and probably they had a great wedding and, and some good times, some challenges, but some, but, but some good times. But then there was a famine in the land, and they had to leave, and they had to leave town. Um, so they brought their, themselves and their two boys that they had. They had Malon and Kilion, so these two boys. In this culture, having a son was a very big deal. It was, it was desirable. Um, they don't have the, the sense of equality that we're starting to see and starting to get to. Um, uh, with that, it was definitely the, the, the male um, presence was meant financial security and, and, um, and, all that, and all that went with that. So they had these two boys, and man, things were good. They were, they were happy with that. But again, they had this famine in the land, and so they, they left. They were refugees in search of food just in order to survive. They went across the Dead Sea, went around it to the country next door to Moab, and that's where they found food. That's where they survived for a number of years. Well, in that process, Naomi's husband dies. He just, we don't know why or how. Um, I'm sure it was, it was unexpected and, and tragic. No one expects to, to see that happen, especially when, when the kids are little. Uh, but, he, but he passes away and, and he dies, and then she's left with her two sons. Her two sons meet, fall in love with, and marry Moabite women. One's named Orpah, and the other one is named Ruth. And so they join the family. Now, they're now a part of things. About 10 years go by, the text says. They're living, they're doing whatever they need to do. 10 years goes by, and both of the two sons, Malon and Kilion, both die. Again, we don't know why, we don't know the circumstances behind that or what happened, but they pass away uh, as well. And then only Naomi and Orpah and Ruth are, are left. They have a conversation, we're going to look at that conversation in a minute, but eventually Orpah leaves, heads back home um, to, to Moab, and then Naomi and Ruth, um, they are left, just the two of them, to head back to Bethlehem. You can see the pain here, right? So this is not just a family tree diagram. This is, this is real life with, with pain and, and heartbreak. Horrible, horrible things. This was never as she planned out. As she planned out her family and her, her future, she never, Naomi never planned on this. She never thought that she would lose her husband and then, and then to lose her, her, her kids as well. And how do you process through that? How do you, how do you move through that? See, here's what I, I realized, and I think what Naomi certainly realized from experience, what we can glean from, from this passage, this story, and we, as we look at her example, and we look at the example of so many people that we love and we hold dear to us in our, in our world that we know, the most horrible things that we get nightmares about in regards to our family, the unthinkable, we are actually not in control of that. We're, we're actually not in control of that. We, we are not. 
and we think we are sometimes, and we trick ourselves into thinking we are. We try to control certain situations, but really the things that mark our families the most, we are the least in control of. Death, loss, I believe God is the giver of life and God is the taker of life, and humans don't get to mess with that. Illness, disease, car accidents, tragedy. We don't get to control these, and yet they mark our families and the, family, and the structures of our families in, in huge ways. It was, it, was just, it was just two days ago, I was sitting in a, in, in a, in a hospital room with some dear friends of ours in, in the NICU, praying with them, begging with them to God that he would save the life of their 11-day-old child. So heartbreaking. And I, it was one of those moments, again, where I just look up to heaven and I shake my head and I say, I don't, I don't understand. God, I don't get it. And I don't have to, I guess, but um, man, it's hard, right? We are not in control because if we were in control of these things, it would be different. The things would be different, right? If we were in control, if you were in control of the things in your family that have so marked you and brought such pain in your life, it wouldn't be the way it is. We need to get to a place eventually with grace and patience, but we've got to get to a place where we can understand that, not just that that's real, but, but that, that we accept that. A confidence that says, you know what, I am confident in who God is regardless of, of the, the, the circumstances that are just unthinkable and heartbreaking. When, uh, when our oldest was born, when Adelina was born, uh, we actually tried to have kids for about five years and, and couldn't, and, and we didn't think we could. We kind of moved on from that, and then, it, and then it happened again. God's the giver of life and the taker of life. Um, we've, we've seen that to be true. So by the time she finally came, we were, we were probably a little paranoid as parents, a little overkill in some senses. Um, in fact, I know this because we bought a book. We went on, we went on Amazon. We bought a book called um, The Paranoid Parent's Guide to Parenting. I mean, it was, it was a legitimate book I can show you. Uh, it's really not that good. It was whatever. It just kind of tells you. But basically what it does, it gives you all the statistical evidence about what you, sh- as a parent, what you actually should be afraid of statistically. You know, like getting struck by lightning, not a really high likelihood that it's going to happen. You know, this, this, this whatever. The, really, the, 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 the highest probability of harm for your kids would happen in what every single one of you did this morning. You got in the car. That'll mess you up, whatever. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I did for me. I remember driving home, driving the scariest drive of my life was that day with my wife and my, our, our newborn daughter in the back seat. I'm going down 390, wondering if there's a way that I can do back roads to get back up here instead of doing 390. I'm, I'm going probably like 35 miles an hour on 390. I'm driving slower than your grandma. All right, I'm white knuckling <laughs> Right, my my knuckles are whiter than my skin, which is quite the thing. With that, um, I, you know, we we all got the baby on board, you know, stickers on the back, and I'm getting mad at like drivers who are driving behind, you know, around me like 45 miles per hour, even though we're on 390. Like, why am I mad at that? Like, here's the thing: I want to be in control. I like to be in control. In fact, what I've learned, the sick thing is that I often, in my family at least, maybe you can identify, I often actually can control just enough to trick me into thinking I can control it all. Or in my job, I can control things just enough that maybe people can think I can control it all, or I think I can control it all. Or in, in my whatever experience it is. And you can identify with that as well. But the reality is that we can't control. The massive things that shape and mark our families, we, we can't control that. And for some of you, that might set you free. Because you can stop trying to control it. You can loosen up a little bit. M- maturity is allowing God to work in us, I believe, in such a way that we get to a place where we, we realize and accept the fact that we're not in control. And that we somehow, we somehow, and it takes time, it's not overnight, but we somehow trust him even when our family experiences deep pain. That somehow, still, we trust God. There's a confidence there that I believe God wants us all to have as we look to lead our families, no matter what role you play in your family structure, whatever that role is, you are an influencer, you are a leader, but you will only lead your family to the right place if you have a confidence that's rooted in God. 
It's a confidence that rooted, that's rooted in and centered in your personal relationship with him. And everything else really is, is shifting sand. As, as followers of Jesus, for those of us who, who, who claim that identity, who have made that commitment, we've got to start living in confidence. The confidence that Job had when he was talking to his wife, right? His wife turns to him. She had already left the faith. She had left Jehovah. She's like, I'm done with this. I can't handle this loss anymore. And she, I understand where she got there, how she got there. But, but he looked back at her and he looked her in the eye and he said, shall we accept good from God and not evil or not trouble rather? Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Or, or the confidence of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace for not bowing their knee to the empire. And they looked at the king and they said, Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we want you to know we won't bow down. There's a confidence there. It may not sound like confidence, but there's a confidence there. The confidence of Paul when he was leaving Ephesus on one of his missionary journeys and heading back to Jerusalem. He met with the people there in the church, tears, crying, um, because they, they knew they would probably never see him again. They were urging him not to go to Jerusalem, but he knew he was called to go to Jerusalem because he had a one-way ticket to Rome, and he was going to bring the gospel with him to Rome. The problem was the people there looking for him were, were wanting his head. It was a one-way ticket to prison. In Rome, he said this, I am going to Jerusalem compelled by the Holy Spirit, not knowing for sure what will happen to me there. I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, the task that God gave me, to testify of the good news of God's grace. That's confidence. Or the confidence that Jesus encouraged John the Baptist with when John the Baptist was in prison. He looked at him and he said, yes, the lame walk, the blind see the deaf hear. I am the Messiah. You're not waiting for another one. I am the Messiah. So listen to this, John. Before you are about to be executed, which he was at the hands of the state, he said this, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is the man or the woman who who goes through horrible, unthinkable, hard things in their life and still retains somehow their faith in God. And that's where we as a church can help. Where you're going to go through hard times, and I'm going to go through hard times, and we're not all going to go through hard times together, so we're going to be strong for each other in those moments, and we're going to stand together and and, and retain our faith through it. Because strong families are led by individuals who are confident. And they're confident in who God is. Not only that, but they're, they're also led by people who are courageous and committed. Let's look at courage. Number two. And you know it's courage. They they have this courage, this internal courage. They, they boldly face their personal pain and they process it in healthy ways. Strong families are led by people who boldly stare their personal pain in the face and they process it in the best way that they know how with a community of support around them. Naomi, in this passage, does not do this. She gets to a place later that's more healthy, but in this first chapter, when we first meet her, in chapter one, she is not processing it well. She has not been processing it well. I want you to see uh, this. And there's no judgment with this. I I can be there. I may be there someday as well. I may say exactly what she says. You may as well. We're all human, and this is her humanity really coming out. It says this. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, after all this had happened, all the loss, her husband, the two sons, um, she says to them, go back, each of, go, go back, go back to your mother's home, go back to Moab. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. When she says go back to your home, that's kind of like a, a, a cultural way of saying prepare to get married again. M- marry somebody else, go find another husband. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them and they wept aloud. I mean, there's tears, emotions, hurt. They said to her, we will go back with you to your people, back to Israel. Naomi said, no, 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 return home, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I mean, I'm your mother-in-law, and I'm, like, depressed and grouchy and mean. I I mean, mother-in-laws are hard enough as it is. I'm like, why would you come? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to my sons, to new sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. There's a cultural thing that's going on here that is hard for us in America, in our culture, to understand. 
Um, in Leviticus, there is a provision in the law called the brother-in-law law. And what this law, real quick, what it did is it was legislation that was in place to protect a widow from being financially destitute. So if you were married um, and you're a woman and your husband dies, he's the breadwinner in your home, he's the one who, who's, you know, he, he's providing for your family, keeping you safe, all that. He dies, then it's his brother would, would, would be tasked with um, and encouraged to, to step in, marry you, and support you. And actually, one of the ways to support you is, would be to have kids and, and, and hopefully to have sons who would then be able to be raised up in the family, carry on the family name, and continue to support. To us, it sounds like, you know, you know you're all sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, my brother-in-law, holy cow. Like, gosh. <laughs> like, like it, it'll, it'll, it'll change your Thanksgiving dinner, let me tell you that. But, um, <laughs> but this, this was very practical and it was understandable in this culture. All right, so she's saying this, like, I, I, I'm not just, I, I don't have a, like, he didn't have a brother, and I, how am I going to find him? I got to find, like, the next, you know, kin over, the next family member. And even if I did find that, like, then I got to have kids, and then, and then because that's going to be Malon and Killian's brother, and then you're going to have to marry that. Like, you just got to wait. I mean, that, that, to follow God's law in that would just be too much. Just stay here. Find a different guy. She says this in in. And uh, it goes on and says, It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. She said, Okay, you don't have to convince me anymore. I know it's hard, but I'm going to leave. But Ruth clung to her, and, and Naomi then said, She said, Look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. Leave with, leave with, her. Leave with her. Look what Naomi says. Again, the Lord's hand has gone out against me. God, the God of heaven has fired his missiles at me and has hurt me. And he has obviously something against me. Not only that, but he does, what she does here, what we so often do when we're in deep personal pain, we don't only, only push other people in our family away, we push our other people in our family away from God. And she says, go back home, go back to your false gods. Go back to your false gods because, because mine obviously isn't, isn't for us. He's going to let you down. You know, we, we all have pain that we've experienced in our life. And how we process that pain has more of an impact on our family than, than, than we sometimes give credit. We, we all experience pain. Here, here's the deal. We have choices when we experience pain. For, for all of us, and your pain is different than mine, and, and mine is different than yours, and my pain that I think I had pain was maybe nothing compared to what's in the future for me. I don't know. We all experience pain, but we have two choices in that. The, the first choice is that we can, once we feel that pain, we can do what's natural and easy and completely understandable, and there's empathy and there's grace. We can escape it, and we numb it. We escape it, and we numb it. You know, if I get a headache, I want to take something, a pill, Tylenol is kind of my go-to. It works for me. Ibuprofen doesn't. Tylenol does. I'll take Tylenol. And it'll take the pain away. Rather than actually asking where that headache is coming from. But I'm going to just numb that. I'm going to escape it. And we do that with a lot of different things. My other choice, though, is, is that I would face that pain head on. I would seek it out. I would look for it. I would find it. I would stare it in the face. And that requires courage. That is not natural. That's countercultural. It's in some ways supernatural. For many of us, our pain was in our childhood. Maybe you have experienced abuse like so many, and I, that's why I, I so much appreciate um, this recent campaign on social media. You probably saw it, the hashtag Me Too. Um, you, you would see those, those hashtags cropping up all over the place, and, it, and what it did is it, 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 it raised a voice that said, there are many, many who are victims of abuse. And it's not just a few, it's not just the ones that, that have talked about it, 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 it awakened our culture, I think, to, to, to the massive impact of that. Maybe you were bullied as a kid, and that was in fifth grade, but now you're 47, and you're still, still wondering if there's some truth to what that fifth grade bully said. Maybe you were assaulted and taken advantage of. Maybe you were pressured in a relationship. You were pressured to do, to do something. It was just so painful. It was so hard, and you're still processing that. 
And we come alongside you and we stand with you because we know that it's a journey and it's not something that is fixed overnight. If it was, you wouldn't be here today. Maybe you experienced a bad breakup or your own divorce and you're still reeling from the pain of that. Maybe you're, you're, if you go even back further, your own parents' divorce and, and the pain of that and you still are, are trying to cope with, with, with that. Maybe it was a loss of a child. Maybe it was a loss of a spouse. We all have pain. We all have pain. Your pain is different than my pain. But here's what I know. The longer I live, a couple things I'm starting to realize. We all, we all look at each other through a set of eyes. And if you really look and stare inside those set of eyes, you'll see some pain. And if you have the courage to really look inside someone's pain and hear their story, empathy will well up inside of you. Because we're all human We've all made choices. We all have deep pain inside of us. For, for me, I, I, had, I want you to know I had great parents. I have great parents. They sacrificed for me. They still sacrificed for me. They loved me. They still love me. They introduced me to Jesus. They brought me to church. Jesus was in our home. But so also was our flesh. And our family was messed up. We, we went to church three times a week, every week, if not four. And I can give you the stories, I can tell it, I'm not going to do it publicly, that's not fair, but it, there's, it was messed up. And this is more the rule than the exception. I think you could look at your, you could t- tell me your family story, your upbringing story, and it is hard. The reality is that few people have the support around them to deal with their pain until sometimes years later, sometimes never. And in the meantime, what we do is we medicate the pain. We numb it. We try to escape it. For Shanna and I, our goal as parents is really less about being the perfect parents. We know that that's not possible. It's more about trying to minimize the amount of hours our kids are going to need to spend in therapy uh, when they get done with us. I mean, that's, that's reality, right? That's true. And we know there's going to be some. We're saving up money for those, those bills already. But we, if we don't deal with the pain, we don't have the courage to stare it in the face, here's what happens. We, we numb and we escape. And we do it in a lot of different ways, and your addiction may be different than the person's addiction sitting next to you. We all have something that's going to pull you out. The problem isn't the pills you're taking. The problem is the pain that you're escaping from. The problem isn't the prescription drugs that you're on. or It's not about the weed that you're on, if that's what it is for you. It's not about the heroin. It's not about the pornography. I mean, some, some addictions are more uh, acceptable than others. I know how that, how that works. It's not about the food. It's not about the alcohol. It's the pain you're medicating with it. It's not about the casinos and the slots or the off-track betting. It's not about that. It's, 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 it's about the pain that you're escaping from. It's not about your addiction to work and the fact that you can't actually be home because you, you're so affirmed at work and you're so... Oh, the affirmation. We all have an addiction, right? Come be honest. We all have at least an addiction we're susceptible to that we are pulled to. And your addiction may be different than my addiction and, and whatever, but we all have it. And that addiction and that hiding and that escaping and that numbing will kill your family. It will destroy it from the inside out. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about right now because it's hurting yours and it has hurt yours. And we have, we, there is love and there is care, but you need to know, you need to understand that we are all in this together, and if we can just together develop the courage to face it, maybe to go to the counseling room together. I, I, I don't know why there's such a problem with counseling, why there's such a stigma with it. I think counselors, people who are truly skilled at counseling are some of the church's heroes, some of our world's community's heroes today. I mean, my wife and I have one on speed dial. <laughs> We, uh, even two, a couple months ago, we were dealing with a situation with some friends and just how do, like, how do we not get messed up and wrapped up in this fray? And we, we got to sit down with him and it was so helpful. There's support groups out there. There's AA, there's NA, there's SAA. There's Celebrate Recovery here every Friday night. Every Friday night, you just show up. They even give you dinner. And it's an, it's an amazing environment. They're like the Navy SEALs of our church, I say. And they just go in and, and, and get right to it and help and support and love we got to face the pain if we're going to find healing. Strong families are led by individual, individuals who are confident, courageous, and also committed. So that's third in your notes, the commitment part. They are determined to come together when others would normally separate. They are determined to come together when others would normally separate. Here's the reality that, that in a couple of weeks, we're going to be sitting down to, to Thanksgiving dinner, right? And some family members probably in your family and your extended family won't be at that table. And it's heartbreaking and it's painful and there's reasons for it. 
but, but when culture says that families should separate, God gives a different message. He says comes together, to, to stick together, to stick with it. I, I love Ruth's determination here. We're going to see this here. If you look at the notes, uh, verses 16 to 17, she says this uh, to Naomi. Don't, please, please, please stop. Naomi, stop. I put that in there. Don't, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and my God, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And then she says this. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. This is, if you're married, this is important. If you have kids, this is, if you have grown adult kids, this is important. If you have somebody in your family that you're like, like about, th- this is so important. It says, may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. Can you say that with anything but death? Say anything but death. Say it with passion from your soul. Anything but death. One more time. Anything but death. I mean, you are blood now. You are in a covenant. You are in a relationship. It is not just for, for, for married people. It's even for us as we have kids, as you have a, a teenage daughter or a teenage son or, or even a, a, an elementary age child, and they are just gone. They are just, their heart and their mind is so removed from your mind and heart. Their values are so distant from you. Bring yourself to the table. Don't separate. They need you now more than ever. They need your investment, your love, your understanding to walk through life through their shoes, to, to, to come around the table and get their perspective and their understanding and patiently, lovingly walk. Don't ever let them push you away. Don't ever let them push. In a world that's filled with division, we need the people of God to be forces of reconciliation in our culture. Nobody else has what we have here. Nobody on CNN or out in, in, your, in, in the world without Jesus has what we have. We have the ability, because of Christ, to bring people together. And if we can't start with our families, how can we help the world? You know, for those of you uh, raising kids, technology is a great thing, but can make this all difficult, right? We were just talking about it with our small group last night. We were together and talking about how, how difficult it is with the, with the TV right next to the dinner table. And, and for us, we, we have a phrase in our home that we're striving to, to say that we are people of the table. So that when there's dinner and there's food on the table, we are people of the table. We're not people of the TV or people of the drive through or something like that. And, and, and there's days where that just has to happen, right? But, but the norm in our home, we want to be people of the table that sit at the table with food on the table um, as God provides with that. And, and, and we light a candle and there's music in the background. And we talk about our day. We say, when, tell me a time when, when, when you were sad today. Tell me a time when you were hurting today. Or tell me a time when, when you laughed uncontrollably today. And get the kids to talk and get them to listen because we want to come together and not separate. And even when our kids grow up and they leave our home, I actually still want them to come back every now and then and to sit at my table. Strong families are led by individuals who are confident, courageous, and committed. Do you want to have a stronger family? I want to. And it's not always strong, and more times it's weak than strong, and feels sometimes, sometimes it's ugly. If you really walked in my shoes and traveled with my family, some days you'd see some pretty ugly stuff. (laughs) But we're trying. We want to try it with you too. Someday, maybe, is today. Because here's the reality that I know is that we have a model to follow. Jesus was our model. Really, he, he led us the way we ought to lead our families. He was confident. He was courageous and he was committed. I want you to listen to these words here in Romans 8. Paul says this. He says, What then shall separate us from God? What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that Jesus, 
that Jesus led you in the same way that you can lead your families. When, when the fury of the justice of God was poured out on him on the cross, he was confident in his purpose. When he writhed in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what was to come, he was courageous and he faced it head on. When he saw the attempts of the enemy to separate us from his father, he committed himself fully to the sacrifice necessary for our good. My question for you, maybe as we close, would be this. Have you come to grips with the fact that he died on the cross for you to give you hope, purpose, to give you mean, to give you even a, a sense of how to somehow lead a very broken family? For some of you, you've, you've, you're ready. You need to do that. You need to take that step. I want to encourage you. Would you pray with me right now? Would you say this? You say, God, I am a train wreck. And my, because of that, my family, in part because of that, my family is, is kind of a mess too. But man, Lord, I know you give me hope. I believe you died on the cross because of your infinite love for me. I believe that you are God. You're not just a normal man. I believe that you died for me. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would take my mess, you take my broken family, you take my broken share of what I brought to that and forgive me. Cleanse me, make me new, clean me up, and help me to follow you. For the rest of us, God, I pray that you would help us as we try to lead, strive to lead our families. Help us to lead them towards you first and let you work out the outcomes and let you be in control. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.